All right, folks. Um, one of you emailed me. Thank you, by the way. That my the 24-1 that I posted. The only vid, the only audio was the movie. So second try and getting this audio to work for 24-1. And thank you very much for letting me know. First of all, we'll do the digestive system overview. The digestive system performs four main functions: ingestion, digestion, both mechanical and chemical, absorption and elimination of wastes. Digestion begins in the mouth, where the teeth break food into smaller particles during mastication. Salivary glands located near the oral cavity secrete saliva, which begins chemical digestion and keeps the food moist. As food is swallowed, the soft palate blocks the upper pharynx to prevent food from entering the nasal cavity and multiple voluntary muscles in the face, neck, and tongue contract, pushing food particles into the pharynx. The food passes over the epiglottis, which prevents food entry into the respiratory system, and then into the esophagus, which connects the pharynx to the stomach. The one-way movement of the food mass, now called a bolus, is controlled by wave-like involuntary muscle contractions. This movement is known as peristalsis. The bolus now enters the stomach. Folds in the stomach wall called rugae allow for expansion as the stomach fills and also increase surface area. Stomach cells secrete hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen, and various regulatory hormones that chemically digest the bolus. Muscular contractions in the stomach churn its contents to further break down the bolus and mix it with stomach secretions to form a thick liquid called chyme. Chyme exits the stomach through the pyloric sphincter and enters the small intestine, the major site of nutrient absorption. The small intestine consists of three parts, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Bile from the liver and gallbladder and digestive enzymes from the pancreas empty into the duodenum to aid in digestion. Absorbed nutrients pass from the lumen of the small intestine into blood and lymph. Chyme not absorbed in the small intestine enters the large intestine. As it passes through the cecum and ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon, water and salts are absorbed and chyme is converted into feces. The rectum stores feces until nervous stimulation initiates the defecation reflex resulting in elimination through the anal canal. All right, folks, that's just the overview. So now let's talk about some more specific things. These are the uh, six functions that your book list is in digestion. And realize that, you know, saying there's six functions is kind of arbitrary. It depends how you dice it up. A couple things I want to talk about. Well, first of all, I'll talk about all six of them. Ingestion is putting something in your mouth, and, and uh, mechanical digestion is chewing it and then your stomach churning it. But there's no breaking of chemical bonds. It's just uh, increasing the surface area of the food by, by mechanically breaking it down. And then there's chemical digestion, and of course, this is enzymes. Enzymes accomplish the chemical digestion. Secretion is the secretion of the enzymes and other uh, other digestive juices. Uh, we'll talk about them as we get to each state. For example, in the stomach, you have to secrete hydrochloric acid to activate the proenzyme pepsinogen into the enzyme pepsin. For example, in the uh, duodenum, you have to secrete, f the pancreas secretes bicarbonate from the pancreas into the duodenum because the enzymes in the duodenum won't be activated in acid. They need a basic environment, so that bicarb neutralizes the acid and makes it slightly basic. So the secretion is secreting all these different things. And by the way, there's hormones that are secreted as well. We'll talk about those hormones. Now, absorption, this is kind of a, this, is, this might be a new concept for you. If you swallowed a marble, so you, you put a marble in your mouth and you swallowed it. And then that marble uh, went all the way through you and came out in your feces. That marble was never inside your body. 
Now, I know we always think of it as when we swallow something that's inside our body, but that marble would never have been inside your body. Your digestive tract is a tube. So uh, that the, the lumen of that tube is not inside your body. Just like if you were to line a whole bunch of donuts up, what's in that tube formed by a whole bunch of donuts lined up is not inside the donut. So when is the nutrient inside your inside your body? And that is when it's absorbed across the intestinal wall into your blood or your lymph. And I suppose it could be your interstitial fluid as well, but uh, typically nutrients go into your blood or lymph. So when is the nutrient inside your body? When absorption occurs. Excretion is when you when you get rid of uh, of unabsorbed waste or it doesn't even have to be waste it's just unabsorbed material it could be something good that you got rid of you don't always absorb you don't absorb everything good that you eat some of it passes through you so that's excretion getting rid of unabsorbed material uh, let me just remind you that we're, what we're really talking about is digesting foods and absorbing the the nutrients to build the four biological macromolecules and those would be lipids so we can eat lipids but we break them down into smaller substances that we can absorb to build up human lipids so we could eat say a cow lipid break it down absorb the the short fatty acids short chain fatty acids and then build them back up into human triglycerides carbohydrates i'm going to abbreviate it carbs because i'm out of room we eat plant carbohydrates like starch we break them down into the monomers. We absorb the monomers. We, re, we rebuild human carbohydrates like glycogen. The um, nucleic acids. Now, there is two biochemical pathways for making DNA and RNA. One's called salvage and one's called de novo. So the salvage pathway is when we actually use the nucleotides that are there in our body we might absorb a nucleotide the de novo pathway is when you build the nucleotides from scratch from raw materials so when we're talking about um, nucleic acid we have to talk about whether we're talking about the salvage or de novo pathway and then lastly is proteins we can eat a cow protein break it down into its monomers amino acids to rebuild the human protein so this is what we're really talking about is uh, these four biological macromolecules. And the word anabolism is build up. So it's building big things from small things like building glycogen from glucose, building proteins from amino acids. The word catabolism is breakdown, like breaking down glucose into CO2 and water, breaking down glycogen into glucoses. And uh, the sum of anabolism and, and catabolism is called metabolism. The sum of anabolism and catabolism is called metabolism. All right. This is just, this is really the anatomy we'll cover in lab. I will tell you that uh, some of these... Uh, Accessory glands will be spending a lot of time on liver and gallbladder. Why is the liver an accessory gland? It actually makes the bile. It's the bile stored in the gallbladder, but the liver makes it. So I circle these accessory glands. We'll be spending quite a bit of time on them. All right. So this picture is not in your book. The next three pictures aren't in your book, but and it's really a phylogenetic explanation or an evolutionary explanation. And uh, the next three slides are not testable. I'll, I'll tell you again when we get to a testable slide. But what I want to explain is we're going to talk about the human body cavities. And we're going to call it a coelom, and it is a coelom. But what the heck's a coelom, and who cares about a coelom anyway? Well, in biology... The coelom is used as a classification tool. Uh, we have coelomates, true coelomates, so have true coelom. We have pseudocoelomates, where they don't have a true coelom, definition to follow. And we have acoelomates, organisms that don't have a coelom at all. Like this planaria you see here, That's a, this is a planaria. 
And um, so what's the, what is a coelom? A coelom is a body cavity. But a true coelom is a body cavity surrounded on all sides by mesoderm. This word right here, mesoderm, there's three embryonic tissue layers in an embryo. And that's uh, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And what these tissue layers become, I mean, we know the endoderm becomes certain things, and we know the mesoderm becomes certain things, and we know the ectoderm becomes certain things. So saying these tissue layers, endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm, is, is also talking about the fate of those tissues. Does it become the liver? Does it become the skin? Does it become a nerve? So a true coelom is a body cavity surrounded on all sides by mesoderm. A pseudocoelomate has a body cavity, but it's only surrounded on one side by mesoderm. The other side, other side is endoderm. And then, of course, an acoelomate doesn't have a body cavity at all. So that's a coelom. A coelom is a body cavity. And then we can talk about coelom formation. And the coelom formation in a protostome is different than the coelom formation in a deuterostome. By the way, humans are deuterostomes. Well, let me just tell you about, tell you about protostomes and deuterostomes briefly. Protostome means first the mouth. Protostome. Stone means mouth. Proto means first. First the mouth. Deuterostome means second the mouth. Well, what the heck does that mean? Well, as an embryo, you have a blastopore right here. Here's the blastopore. A protostome, the blastopore becomes the mouth. You can see the blastopore became the mouth. First, you make the mouth. Second, you make the anus. But a deuterostome, this blastopore becomes the anus. And it's second the mouth. So you make the mouth second. And, now that's just explaining to you what the words protostome and deuterostome mean. But the formation of the coelom here is different between protostomes and deuterostomes. The formation of the coelom for the archenteron it occurs, well, the formation of the coelom occurs from the archenteron and a deuterostome. The formation of the coelom in a protostome occurs from a solid mass of mesoderm. Now, they're both going to have true coelom. They're both going to have mesoderm surrounding the, the coelom but they form differently. All right. And then, of course, just to show you where we are, we are deuterostomes. Humans are deuterostomes. Humans are chordates. We have spinal cords. We're vertebrates. So you can see that. If you did the... If you did the... Uh, see, I don't even know if I can do this, to be honest with you. Let's see. If you did the... King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Our kingdom is the animal kingdom. Our phylum is chordata. Our subphylum is vertebrata. Not class, but subphyla. Because there are some chordates that have a notochord, but not, not spinal cords. And um, I'm not going to get into the difference between notochord and spinal cords right now. Our class is uh, mammalia, hopefully. Our order is, is it primate? No, hominid. Yeah, primate. Hominid. Oh, I did it. <laughs> Homo sapiens. Wow, I'm shocked. This is not really my area of biology, folks. But that's uh, our classification. And we are chordata. We are chordata. Really, not my area of biology. I mean, I really don't like taxonomy, but there you go. By the way, uh, this taxonomy in, uh, does have a role, and I think it is important. Uh, I like phylogenetics a lot more than taxonomy. What phylogenetics, and they're linked, by the way, they're linked. But phylogenetics is evolutionary history. This is really, uh, this, this chart right here is really phylogenetics because it's talking about tissues and true tissues and bilateral symmetry and everything we just talked about. It's really phylogenetics right here, but it's also linked to uh, taxonomy, obviously, because we're talking about chordates. All right. All right, so now we're back to testable material. This is testable material. Humans are coelomates. We are deuterostomes, chordates, and we are coelomates. We have true coelom right there. 
And um, notice that the coelom is the body cavity, the, not the lumen of the digestive tube. This lumen of the digestive tube is not inside our body. All right, but the the body cavity is inside our body. The coelom, the coelomic cavity is going to become the peritoneal cavity. And I'm going to remind you from Bio 203, you have a visceral peritoneum. That's the part of the coelomic cavity with the mem serous membrane directly surrounding the organs. And we have a parietal peritoneum right here. This is like the fist in the balloon. Uh, let me remind you that, um, you know, if you had a fist, thumb, one, two, three, four, there's your fist. And you stuck your fist into a balloon. This is from Bio 203 now. The part of the balloon touching your fist is called the visceral serous membrane. And why do I say visceral serous membrane? Because if it was on the lungs, it would be visceral pleura. If it was on the heart, it would be visceral pericardium. If it was on the stomach, it would be visceral peritoneum. So the serous membranes have different names depending on where they're located. And the part of the balloon not touching your fist is called the parietal serous membrane. If it was on the lung, it would be the parietal pleura. If it was on the heart, it would be the parietal pericardium. If it was on the stomach, it would be the parietal peritoneum. So that's kind of what it's like. Now, that's pretty easy. And these organs of the peritoneal cavity are surrounded by visceral and parietal peritoneum the hard part if you recall comes from this the peritoneal cavity or the serous cavity it could be the pleural cavity or the pericardial cavity let's talk about the peritoneal cavity since we're doing digestive system is really this space right here that's really the peritoneal cavity now is my fist inside that balloon no it's not the fist is not inside the balloon it's not really inside that peritoneal cavity at all. But then you ask your question this, does the peritoneal cavity surround your fist? And the answer is yeah. My peritoneal cavity surrounds my fist. So technically my organs aren't in my peritoneal cavity, but my peritoneal cavity surrounds my uh, organs. And that's where the that's where it that's where the confusion comes from. By the way, we usually say the stomach is in the peritoneal cavity, the small intestines in the peritoneal cavity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is some anatomy right here. You can just see some anatomy, and uh, you can see that our organs are held in place, and our in our abdominal pelvic cavity, they're held in place by connective tissue like the omenta and the mesocolon and things like that. But this picture is better. This is showing you the organs being surrounded by the peritoneal membranes. So, for example, the parietal peritoneum is right here. If I were to follow that around, I would eventually get in here and get the visceral peritoneum. Now I'm on visceral peritoneum. This is all visceral in here. So, keep going. See, this is visceral surrounding that... Um, sigmoid or rectum rectum it looks like yeah so you can see parietal and visceral peritoneum and this is even better but let me point something out so first of all let me show you that it's labeled you have the parietal peritoneum right there and i guess they don't label the visceral peritoneum but the visceral peritoneum would be this stuff right here surrounding the organs that's a visceral peritoneum all right but let me show you something some of these organs, like the part of the pancreas, not the entire thing, the duodenum, the kidneys not shown, unfortunately. The kidneys are also retroperitoneal. Some of these organs are retroperitoneal. They're not completely, they're not surrounded by um, visceral peritoneum. They're not. They're behind the peritoneal cavity. They're retroperitoneal. And that's kind of cool that we have some of these organs behind the retro, behind the peritoneal cavity or retroperitoneal. This is uh, lab stuff, really. These are the four tunics, the four tunics of uh, 
of basically your entire alimentary canal. It's the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis externa, and the serosa. Those are the four tunics. Now, um, serosa and, and a lot and a big part of my alimentary canal is also the visceral peritoneum. That's not true for the esophagus. It's not visceral peritoneum in the esophagus. Think about it. The esophagus is in the thoracic cavity. How could it possibly be visceral peritoneum around the esophagus? But serosa is typically visceral peritoneum in, uh, below the diaphragm. Now, why do we call it muscularis externa? There's two layers in the muscularis externa. There's a, longi there's a circular layer and there's a longitudinal layer. Well, we call it muscularis externa because right here, Right there, between the mucosa and submucosa, a really thin layer, is a mucosa muscularis. It's a muscular layer. It's a muscular layer between the mucosa and the submucosa. That's where it is. And it does local, when it contracts, it has local uh, results. It doesn't cause peristalsis. It does not cause peristalsis and, and do big gross movements of the intestines, but it does have um, lend to local movements of my folds and my villi. And that's why we call the muscular layer the muscularis externa because there's another muscular layer called the mucosa muscularis. Or you could actually say muscularis mucosa as well. All right, that's the four tunics. We'll talk about them uh, more, but that's really a lab thing. This is another picture of the four tunics, and you can, uh, by the way, you can see the mucosa muscularis or the muscularis mucosa, however you want to say it, right here. This is it right here. It's between the mucosa and the submucosa. Look at something else here. Look at the nerve plexuses in the submucosa. Look at the nerve plexuses in the muscularis externa. In the submucosa, these nerve plexuses are called submucosal plexus. In the ex muscularis externa, they're called myenteric plexuses. These are part of what we call the enteric nervous system. Some people think the enteric nervous system is a subdivision of the autonomic nervous system. And I tend to agree. But here's the thing, the autonomic nervous system does talk to the enteric nervous system. In other words, your central nervous system does talk to your enteric nervous system because as you know, your hypothalamus controls your autonomic nervous system. But here's the caveat, the enteric nervous system can act all by itself. It doesn't need the brain. It doesn't need the brain. It doesn't need the rest of the autonomic nervous system. It can actually act all by itself. All right. This is a fold. Let me go back. Let me go back again. See these folds right here? They got one fold and another fold and another fold and another fold and another fold. Fold, fold. These folds are called different things depending on where they're located. In the stomach, the folds are called rugae. In the small intestine, the folds are called plica circularis. Circularis. So all through the all through the alimentary canal, we have these folds. But you know, depending on where they're located, if it's the stomach, we call them rugae, and the small intestine, we call them plica circularis. So we have we have folds. That's the bottom line. We have folds. Now, let's go forward. Before I go forward, let me point something out. On a fold, I have all these finger-like projections. They're called villi. In between folds, I have finger-like projections called villi. So in other words, I have these finger-like projections sticking out all over the place. This is a fold. This thing right here is a fold, not a finger-like projection. I know it looks like a finger-like projection, but it's an entire fold. These are the finger-like projections sticking off the fold. Those finger-like projections are called villi. So this is a fold with villi. You can see there's lacteals in my folds. And in fact, what I'm going to show you later is some of these lacteals go up into each finger-like projection. They will. There will be a lacteal inside each finger-like projection. All right, I can't think of anything else to tell you on this. 
Okay, peristalsis. Well, let's go back. These two muscle layers, the circular muscle layer here and the longitudinal muscle layer here, these are responsible for peristalsis. Peristalsis is when the longitudinal muscles contract and you get a wave, you get a contraction wave going, going like that. Now, how come that contraction wave can't go both directions? It can. It certainly can go both directions. And in fact, uh, with without the circular muscles involved, that contraction wave does go in both directions. It absolutely does. But we get our circular muscles involved. And what our circular muscles do is they contract right here. And they're, they're relaxed in front of the bolus of food, but they're contracted right here. So now when the longitudinal muscles contract, the bolus of food can only move one direction. Because we're, we're blocking the, the reverse movement of the food. So when both muscles are acting together, when you have the circular muscles contracting behind the bolus of food and the longitudinal muscles contracting, they can only push the bolus of food one direction. That's not to say that, that um, 2, 3, and 4 right here, 2, 3, and 4 doesn't occur. It does occur. In fact, this is called segmentation. When your circular muscles contract and break up that bolus of food, that's called segmentation. And then if you contract your longitudinal muscles and the circular muscles aren't uh, keeping, aren't making the direction go one direction, you can actually s spread out that bolus of food. But when they act together, we contract the circular muscles right here, constrict the intestine behind the bolus of food. We contract the longitudinal muscles, which push, and they can only push that bolus of food one way. And that's the wave of contraction. This is another look at it. This actually shows you the circular muscles right here. So remember, the inside muscles are the circular muscles contracting, constricting the backward movement of that bolus of food. And then you have the longitudinal muscles contracting, moving this bolus of food forward. All right. Now, in the rest of this, these lectures, we are going to... Um, be talking about control and that's actually the meat of the chapter the control is always going to come in these three mechanisms there's going to be local factors that are going to start this control these are usually stretch and chemicals so stretch and chemicals pH is detected by chemoreceptors uh, physical distortion would be stretch receptors so Stretcher chemicals will be local factors that initiate some of our control mechanisms. Now we have short reflexes where they go up through the submucosal or the myenteric plexus, turn right back around, and act on the very area that the food is in. So this short reflex could lead to secretory cells releasing its products like hydrochloric acid or, ga or a hormone like... Uh, gastrin or an enzyme like pepsin or any number of things secretory cells releasing their products and then we have these secretory cells some of them are endocrine enteroendocrine cells they release the hormone that enters the bloodstream and turns right back around and acts on the very intestine that started it likewise we have these long reflexes which go up to the central nervous system and these long reflexes that go to the central nervous system will send information back down through the autonomic nervous system. And you can see right here, typically it's down through the parasympathetic motor fibers. And as you can imagine, cranial nerve 10 is a big one. That's the wandering nerve. So that's the big one coming down to the, uh, to the abdominal pelvic cavity. All right. Now, if we're talking about salivation, now you can start talking about cranial nerve number 9, cranial nerve number 7, and remember 3, 7, 9, and 10 were the parasympathetic nerves. 3, 7, 9, and 10. So, that's the control mechanisms that we're going to talk about all the way through.